From the Ear to There Travel Studio, this is the Ear to There Disney Podcast. The Ear to There Podcast, it's time to start the show. Be sure to hold on tight, here we go. Exploring all the different Disney destinations. Ear to There, it's time to start the fun. Hello, podcast listener. This was... Originally, episode number 38 of the Ear to There Disney podcast. I apologize for the echo. I am recording on the go, but I wanted to make sure I still put a bonus episode out this week. So these are episodes that came out before, but they've been pulled by Apple Podcasts. And this is an episode I did with Chuck that's all about the most controversial decisions that Walt Disney World has ever made. So bad echo and all, grab a drink. Grab a snack. And as a famous mouse once said, on with the show. Janet Jackson and Justin Timberlake's Super Bowl wardrobe malfunction. Tom Brady and Deflate Gate. And now, removing the handles from the refillable mugs in Walt Disney World. These are some of the biggest controversies pop culture has ever seen. All right, that's a little heavy for an intro of a show. Seriously, even the most magical place on earth is not free from controversy. And this week, we're going to be looking at the most controversial decisions ever made in Walt Disney World. Here to have what is sure to be an interesting conversation about Walt Disney World's most controversial decisions is a gentleman who is no stranger to controversy himself. In fact, he's planning a protest in the Magic Kingdom on the day when Stitch's Great Escape is finally shuttered for good. Chuck Rodriguez, welcome back to the show. Thank you, Phil. And that is correct. I will be sending out a Twitter feed from that day. And basically, my controversy is, why didn't they close it sooner? (laughs) I thought you were going to chain yourself to the the Stitch animatronic inside. (laughs) No, I was actually going to go in with a bulldozer and help them. (laughs) Well, you're getting your wish. It's it's seasonal, right? It's or it's going to be seasonal really soon. Yeah, so, seasonal to as it, which is a code word for closing. Yeah, remember when uh, twenty thousand leagues under the sea was seasonal, and then all of a sudden it just never opened again. Exactly. So, so yeah, so forget about it. It's gone. It's good as gone. All right. So this is going to be a cool topic, I think, because Disney's no, they're no stranger to controversy, and I love that I really like this idea for a show because I think we can go kind of all over the place with it. But to be fair to Disney, right, they have to keep making changes. The changes aren't popular, aren't always popular. I mean, I had I just had episode 35 by Lee Cockrell on, and he's, we were talking about replacing, you know, some of the older attractions, which I'm sure will come up in this podcast. And right. he said like 60 to 70% of the people are happy, but the rest are usually really upset about any big changes they make. And he said he actually used to get hate mail after like certain things, attractions were closed. So if they get 60 to 70% approval, I think that's pretty high. You know what I mean? Yes. I mean, if the, yes, it's like, well, Disney World is like an analogy for just like maybe the government actually, <laughs> but that's all, but that's a podcast for a whole different podcast. <laughs> yeah. That's a, that's a different, it's a different, <laughs> that's a whole format. different thing. Yes. <laughs> but by, by coincidence, uh, my friends and I were at Epcot last night and, and, and a certain topic came up where we said, you know, it is like, like, you know, our our relationship with Walt Disney World, it's no different than a person that you really love. Yes, you love them, but you still are going to criticize, you know, when they do something wrong or you're going to point it out or you're going to be upset once in a while when they do something that you don't like. But it doesn't mean that you don't love them for the rest of your life. That's a really good analogy. It's like, yeah, it, it's like because there's the there's the Disney fan and then there's the Disney fan boy, which there's two different it's two different things, right? Correct. You get the fan who. Loves Disney and, you know, will work, work, you know, the way through anything they don't like. And then there's a fanboy where nothing could ever be wrong. Everything that Disney does is perfect, which is kind (laughs) of, I hope that's not what I am, but maybe it is. I don't know. No, No, not at all. No, because I definitely came up with some of these that I agree with on these, on this list. So, all right, without, without further ado. So Chuck, since you're the guest and since you probably have more than me, you go, you can go first. Okay, I'm gonna. I'll. I'll just go ahead with the uh, with the big guns first. I'm gonna go with the concept of of um, Fast Pass Plus. 
All right. <laughs> now, definitely I'm sure list. you – I think you and I agree on this one. We're definitely the cut up of people be like, you know what? Not only do it, but do it so that it's even more – technologically advanced as quickly as possible. I, I love it. I do not have a problem with the fact that we gave up the paper system. My, my biggest problem with the paper system, of course, we didn't know any better back then, but it was annoying when I would go with my family or friends, we'd enter the Magic Kingdom, and then the first thing that had to happen was somebody had to grab the, the tickets of every single person in the group and then run you know, a mile away to the attraction that you wanted to get the, the tickets for and then run back somehow and and hopefully catch them or maybe even miss out on the first attraction because they went on a ride while you were getting the fast best tickets for everybody else. That was very annoying. You had to find like the most in shape and fastest person in your party to do that. Right, which was never me, but they still <laughs> sent me anyway. <laughs> I, and I would always just uh, stop and get myself some chocolate ice cream on the way. Yeah, so I, it was a problem. That was a problem <laughs> sending you, yeah. You're, you're not, tr- <laughs> not trustworthy in that sense. No, not at all. So I love the new system. And as a local, you know, for the past six years with an annual pass, you know how awesome it is that I could literally sit in my apartment and realize, you know, I've got nothing to do this afternoon or evening because, you know, my plans changed or whatever. So I go onto my app. I check to see, first of all, how the wait times, you know, are, are going. So if it's a very crowded day, I'm like, hey, I'm not going to bother. Or I go ahead and look at what's fast passes available, you know, three or four hours later. And then I decide to go based on that. Yeah, that's really- I, I think that's that's awesome. That is. It is awesome. And it is awesome when you're so close that you can make, you know, those decisions on the fly and kind of get there whenever, whenever you can. I see this was on my list too. the, the past best boss. Obviously it's, it's a big, it was a big topic of debate when it was first announced. And when they first, there were so many problems with the system when it first was put sure. in place that man, <laughs> I'm actually really glad I wasn't doing what I do now then because, oh, yeah, some, yeah. oh man, there were some issues, but the thing is, it does. It makes it drastically different, drastically to, to playing your vacations to Walt Disney World. That's when you're not a local. Uh, you know, with you have to do your tick, your your fast passes sixty days in advance. Which some people want that old that old school that old feeling, the Disneyland feeling of just showing up at the park and then kind of seeing where the day takes you. And you really can't do that anymore, unless you you're content with riding, you know, People Mover, Carousel of Progress. Pirates, and that's going to be your headliner of the day, or you're comfortable waiting 70 minutes for uh, Seven Doors My Train. So, but I listen, I, I like it a lot. I, I think I love being able to plan the vacation. I love knowing that I'm going to, okay, listen, I might not get on Dumbo today, but we're going to do Seven Doors My Train. We're going to do Splash Mountain. We're going to do Space Mountain. And then we'll have the rest of the day to wait in line for things. I really like that. So for me, I think it's a, it was a great change. I can get, I get it. I get people that were opposed to it. I get the people who don't like the, their, that Disney can now track you with your magic band, but I'm not going to wear a tinfoil hat in the park and try to block the signal. <laughs> you know, that's just not going to be me. I, I'll happily take the technological advancement and plan my vacation way in advance and worry about what other information Disney's, you know, gaining for me later on. I don't really, I'm not really worried about it. That is correct. And I have, I've had this conversation with family and friends and I've called them on the ones that, that start to say like, oh yeah, it was nicer in the past when you just walk around and just do things as you walk past them, um, you know, no particular order. And I'm like, no, you, you are remembering something that never actually happened. So yeah, I agree. It was never that pleasant. No, you're remembering it wrong. I'm telling you right now, you're remembering <laughs> it wrong. I think you're right. I, I, I think people think that and you're right. It didn't happen that way. It, most likely it was a hundred degrees. You got to, it's a small world. There was a line outside the covered area. It was 60 minutes and you were like, ah, ah what are we going to do? That's more likely what the vacation looked like. And you know, I, I don't miss the paper fast passes. I do like them when I go out to the West Coast and do it there. But yeah, people romanticize how it quote unquote used to be, I think. I really They do. do. And I feel like people being unrealistic about what what the effects have been in, in two different ways. First of all, if you are because I know that it's that it's still not happening and in, in Disneyland and that if it does, people might actually riot. <laughs> I don't get it because it's not, if I, you know, me living 40 minutes from Walt Disney World is no different than I lived if I live 40 minutes from Anaheim. And if I suddenly be like, oh, I got nothing to do Friday night, I'll go to Disneyland and just walk around. That's no 
it, it, it's not it's not affected by the fact really that there's fast pass now. I would still walk around the park, enjoy it, and go on something that doesn't have a line, or or wait till the very end of the night when nothing has a long line. I, yeah, I don't see the problem. No, I don't either. But you're right. I think that will be a dark day in Anaheim <laughs> if that happens because it is much more of a locals park as I, we were just talking about. On the yes, podcast, of course it speaking. is. Yes. You know. All right. So now I got to go to my first one. And okay. I'm going to kind of stay in the same, it's a little bit different, in the same vein, but different. And I'm going to say the price increases have been incredibly controversial lately. Uh, but listen, I understand the ticket prices, what I'm talking about, not the food or anything, which are also going up. By the way, did you, this is a tangent, tangent alert. The <laughs> the uh, buffalo chicken waffle is back. The spicy chicken waffle is back at Sleepy Hollow Refreshments. In the match, yes. it was gone for a while. They brought it back. This, you know, this is we're recording this on October fourteenth. They just brought it back a day or two ago, and it's small. The waffles the same size. The chicken is like half the size that it used to be, and they upped the price by three bucks. Three bucks. Yeah, it went from like seven something to ten something. I don't listen. I'm not. I love that sandwich. I thought it was, you know, I guess you call it a sandwich, a waffle sandwich. I loved it. I, I'm probably going to get it, but. I think that three dollar increase is a little, little insane for a smaller piece of chicken. Anyway, just my tangent. My I get off my soapbox. So, <laughs> my my pre- the price increases I'm talking about are the ticket prices, and I get why people are upset about it. Listen, it's not an inexpensive vacation. It's not something that most people can afford to do every year. Prices go up frequently. They go up a couple times a year now. It seems, and but the thing is. It's the same. They're basically the same prices as the park down the road, uh, and they're not. They're not over. You know, they're not outpricing that park at all. And Disney, frankly, has more to offer. There's more parks. There's more water parks. There's more resorts. There's Disney Springs. There's, which I think, obviously, now just kind of blows away City Walk and what they have. Agreed. The uh, but you know. They're going to raise prices, and it, not everyone can afford to go frequently. But if you are smart about it, if you look at the time of year when it's most cost effective to go, if you notice that you're basically not, you're not always better off. This is going to be another shameless plug, and I love putting these into the show. You're not always better off doing it yourself. Contact someone who knows what they're doing. If it's me, if it's not me, if it's a different professional, whatever, because there are times when you can go. For literally a fraction of the price, you can go. Like if you're going to Christmas, if you're going to, you know, at Thanksgiving, if you're going over, even over the summer, those prices are going to be high because everyone's going then, and it's expensive and it's. But if you know someone who knows the ways around it and can help you, and you're willing to stay at a, uh, you know, you don't want a deluxe resort for the week, and you can you can really make it affordable. So, listen, the fact is. Disney's a business. They're in the business of making money, and you're just going to have to kind of, unfortunately, deal with it if you're going to want to go to Walt Disney World. It's the way it is. Agreed. Um, This topic does come up a lot here in my little uh, social circle, and I can only address it with my, you know, obviously how it affects me personally. Now, I like to say that I, you know, I'm in that growing, uh, growing demographic where. I do live alone, obviously, and so I do a lot of sociable things, and I like to say that my home is uh, PPP-free, people, pets, or plants. So <laughs> I do socialize a lot, and any time so that I go out— So you hate all living things, basically. You that's right. You hate everything that's alive. Uh, all living things. So if, if I'm going to go out you know, on a Friday or Saturday night with friends, I am going to spend, on average, a good— you know, 40, 50, 60 dollars at least on an evening of fun. And that's just for a few hours. There's no difference. That's no different to me going for a few hours to Walt Disney World. Um, I'm already paying approximately 42 a month for the annual pass. And then if I do go ahead and spend 30 or 40 dollars, you know, on a meal or something else, then it's really the same thing. I, I, I know that when the, when the prices first started to inch up towards 100 dollars, there were a lot of articles that said, that you have to compare it to, for example, you know, if, if you if you purchase a hundred dollar ticket for a Broadway show or I don't know, I never go see sporting events, but I'm assuming that there are some stadiums or some seats in stadiums that could be a hundred dollars. That is a two th- or three hours of entertainment for a hundred dollars. 
So at the theme parks, you get $100 for up to 9, 10, 11, 12 hours, or even 16 hours, depending on the operating day. I you agree? Really, dude, you know what, Chuck? I love the way you put that, and I wish I could have put it that way. Because you put it so... I always kind of equated to the movie theater thing, where you pay however much for two hours of entertainment. You pay yes. the, the price of a ticket, and then you have the, the food is astronomical, and the drink, and it's, it's crazy, unless you're sneaking your own food in, which... You know, listen, we have little kids. We do that. Don't tell anyone. Um, <laughs> but, you know, my kids won't eat the movie theater candy. We bring pretzels. Um, but, you know, you're right. It's If you compare it to other forms of entertainment, it's really not outrageous. And, I, yeah, I just I don't want to say more than that because I love the way you put it. I think that was very, very well said. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, I do. That's it, like, <laughs> no, that wasn't meant to be an accident. It was literally <laughs> just a thank you. I, I do have one thing which because of what you do, you might have an interesting take on it. For me and my family, for example, you know, this coming next weekend, it is my birthday and my niece's birthday. So it has become our tradition to spend the weekend, um, and it actually falls on the weekend this year. But anyway, to spend the weekend at Walt Disney World because they live 90 minutes away and they have annual passes as well. So we, 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 we try to look for, um, you know, to treat ourselves to a hotel room for one or both nights of the weekend. And so we're perfectly fine with just getting any hotel room in the relative, you know, Kissimmee, Lake Buena Vista area. But we do start off by looking at the Walt Disney World um, reservations. And we did just a couple days ago. We thought, oh, last minute, a little treat. There was only two things available. <laughs> right. And it was either like $700 a night or $1,700 a night. Yeah. So, that has gotten a little bit ridiculous. I, I remember the days when living in Miami, you know, when I first moved to Florida, and it was very possible to be like, oh, you know what? I suddenly have a weekend. Let's go to Walt Disney World for the weekend. And we'd look, and we could easily get the moderate or value price hotels for less than 100 bucks a night and treat ourselves, or maybe even with a Florida resident discount. Now, not so much. Not see, so much. See, so, and that kind of also goes, in, it goes against the argument that this is too expensive because – those rooms are sold out. Like everything's, it's always sold out. Like and that's said, the problem. I think we, you know, us, maybe us normal people have to accept the fact that there's a lot more people in the world than there used to be who can afford things a little bit better than what we normal people can afford. I agree. <laughs> and it, it's, you know, that's why somebody's going to pay an outrageous amount of money to stay in the Polynesian bungalows. They're going to, correct. Those are sold out every night. They're sold out every night. And they right. are because there are people that, hey, listen, they can afford it. They're going to do it. And, that's the thing. And to pe people, you're right. There's so many more people in the world and more, so many more people now know to plan it so far out. I mean, I can remember living in Orlando and, you know, my wife and I getting a hotel room the day of in Walt Disney World, like just calling Correct. and getting Port Orleans Riverside that night. Or Correct. We got the Polynesian in a standard room that night. Yeah. Forget that now. Forget it. There's no way you're getting that. I mean, once in a while, if someone cancels, you can get lucky. Uh, other than that, yeah, you have to you have to book it far out. I mean, I always suggest to people people I get this in my email all, all the time. People will say, "Well, I'm not really looking to go for a year. When should I book?" And I always say, "Now, just book the right. room, put the deposit down. If you're not going, if you end up not going, and it's only a couple months, you know, you're still a few months out, you can cancel it, and that that deposit's refunded to you. It makes perfect sense to put." To get the, to book way early, way in advance, put that two hundred dollar deposit down on a package reservation, and just if you can't go, you can get your money refunded. Anyway, I don't want to be too much of a travel agent here. It's <laughs> way too boring. Okay, so I think you're up, right, Chuck, for your next one. Yes, and I I'm, I wasn't gonna necessarily pick this one, but because it goes with the last two things we've said, I'm we might as well touch upon it. Okay. Um, the controversial Disney dining plan. Obviously, for what you do and uh, and for your clients, it is wonderful. For us locals, it stinks to high <laughs> heaven. Let me tell you what. <laughs> Again, it goes back to the whole birthday thing. I mean, you would think that a month ago, when we began to plan our special birthday weekend, that that we could, you know, we're willing to spend almost 70 or $80 per person for a really nice dinner at Walt Disney World. Nothing, 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 nothing. We're just going to have to either go to a Disney Springs restaurant, which is also nice, or we're going to have to just go up to the podium and see. But there's a lot of times when, I, when we go, um, and I would say at least once a month, we probably will go to the studios and go up to Mama Melrose, for example, and say, do you have any openings? And they say, no, don't even bother. It's, it's booked for the rest of the, the day. 
And that's Mama Melrose. It's not even someplace that special. <laughs> no, so some, you just upset somebody. You just upset somebody whose mom, who Mama Melrose is the favorite <laughs> restaurant. I sitting, mean, I like it. I they're sitting in their once car. Once a month, if I didn't, they're sitting but in their car. But it's not upset. like going. It's not like going to you know Cinderella's Royal Table no. or to or to um, I don't know one of the Epcot restaurants that's always hard to get into compared to the ones that are relatively easy usually. No, you're right, and I think Disney tr- they've really tried to address this issue by making you put a credit card guarantee they have yes. a reservation. I also think people are just eating that and if they if they don't show up. I think I don't know if the the penalty isn't high enough for people because what I think people used right. to do is they used to make multiple re- reservations at different restaurants and it with the with the new My Magic Plus system, not new. I mean it's been around for a while now, but with the My Magic Plus system you can't really do that now. You, you can't go on a, you know, it has a, there's, unless you do it on their multiple accounts, you can't make reservations for more than one place at the same time. It just won't allow you to do it. Um, Correct. But I think that's what, what people would do in the past is make multiple reservations. It wasn't, they basically gave their name. It wasn't tied to their ticket. And, you know, that's, but now, what I don't know, like I said, I don't know if the fine's not hot, not the fine, but if Disney still charges you, if you don't charge for your reservation, if it's not high enough or, if they're too lenient with the last minute cancellations, because I'll be honest with you, I've canceled reservations and I don't recommend anyone, you know, doing this, but I've canceled res- reservations two hours before and, you know, they didn't charge me a cancellation fee. So I don't know what it is, but it's still keeping the restaurants booked and it's hard, very, very hard to get in to any, really any uh, table service restaurant day of. It's, it's almost impossible. So. You're right. Well, I, I actually, my, my theory, honestly, is that it's happening because it just really is more popular to eat at a nice Disney restaurant. It's not, I don't, my, my theory is maybe it does not have to do with the, with the actual Disney dining system or the way to make the reservations and, and guarantee it. I think it's just because unlike when we were growing up and coming here often in the 80s and 90s or when we first lived here in the early 2000s, it just it's just more popular to treat yourself to a nice fifty to seventy dollar a person Disney restaurant. And the, the listen, let's be for real. The the food has gotten better in Walt Disney World. There's of can, course you can kind of you can get whatever you want whenever you want it. I mean they have they have really good options: steak and seafood and pasta and and you know di- different kind of cultural like different countries of foods and like in Epcot itself, every country has a sit down restaurant where except for. America, weirdly enough, but every other one has a nice table service restaurant where you can sit and have a really good dinner. And yeah, it's it's just the food's better. They up their game and it makes it harder. You're right. Agreed. All right. So my turn and I am, let's see where I'm going. You know what? I'm going to go with this one. And I didn't have a problem with it when it, when it happened, but it was a big controversy. Uh, the removal of the sorcerer hat at Hollywood Studios. So the the hat was put in what September of two thousand one, uh, as part of the hundred years of magic celebration, right? And, yes. And two thousand one. So a lot of people, I mean, they they never saw Hollywood Studios without the hat, and they're the only people, honestly, that I get that would be upset because if you're a kid, if you're fourteen, fifteen years old, and your whole life you've been going to Walt Disney World, and the hat's been there, well, you're yeah, you're upset when it's like removing. Spaceship Earth for me and you. So I get it. I, but I, I don't get anyone else who is upset because I love the way the park is now. I, with, the, with the exception of the big stage being there for Star Wars. Hopefully once Star Wars land is, is completely oh, yes, I'm sure that they will. stage. But I, I love the, the view when you walk into the park, look down Hollywood Boulevard and see the Chinese Theater in a distance. To me, that is how I first saw the park. That's how the fir- the park was originally supposed to be, and I it's it just makes it it, it brings it, everything kind of back full circle for me. I love that view. I love that walk. Now I love it at night when you're walking down in the theaters lit up in the in the distance. You know the hat didn't do it for me. You, see, you saw the hat there; it was lit up. It was basically a pin store, right? I mean, that's what it was. You can get pins and sunscreen in there. So oh, great. So for me, it never had a special place. You know, in my heart, but I don't know. How do you feel? Did you, did you? It wasn't something like that was special to you, right? No, for crying out loud! I, I thought from the <laughs> first day that the hat went up, I thought it was the dumbest thing ever. And 
and and I think you're right. I'm, I'm I am I assume that the only people who truly were upset about it are the people who um you know that's that's how they've known the studios is with the hat and not those of us who thought without. So let me just add that now that I'm about to turn 41 years old, I will never, never care about the opinion of a 14 or 15 year old again <laughs> in my entire life or anybody younger than 15 years old. So I really could care less if they're upset. Oh, such a nice, <laughs> nice gentleman you are. Um, <laughs> but you do care about my kids when they come and talk to you. You listen to their <laughs> Well, <laughs> yes, except on this one. If they say, oh, I missed a hat, I'm like, really? <laughs> they're not even going remem- to remember it. But no, they're not going to remember it. Not- None of the kids in my life at the moment would remember it. Right, let's not, but let's not make you out to be a complete monster here. I mean, more people <laughs> to tune into this episode and other episodes that you're in. But yeah, no, I, I, I agree. I, I think, uh, not that I won't listen to kids. Jeez, I, I don't agree with that. But I do <laughs> agree with the fact that, yeah, I think that's who was. And it, I said just kids, but I also mean. Adults who never went to Walt Disney World, who went in that time. Good point. Yes, there are plenty of people who sure. wouldn't have started going. That's right. Sure. And, you know, I just like the, the park being back to its original glory. I think that's – it's really cool to see it like that. And if only they would put in David Copperfield's restaurant that we were promised so many <laughs> Oh, years my God. Ago. Remember, there used to be a billboard out I in know. the front saying coming soon. I yeah. know. And I came the next year and it was gone and there was no restaurant. I was like, I don't – it was supposed to be like under Phantasmic, right? There was under the seating area, I think, of where Phantasmic went was supposed to be. Oh, I don't know what it was supposed to be. The David Copperfield restaurant. And it was, yeah, it was huge. It was just big. Anyway, that's completely off the topic. Um, <laughs> all right, so you're up for your next one. Okay, I'll go with, I think, a relatively uh, simple one. Um, the Starbucks being added to all four parks. Dude, I swear to God, you have my list in front of you. I figured. <laughs> so I... You know, the funny thing with me, people who know me know that until last year when Santa Claus uh, brought me a Keurig machine, I've never had a cup of coffee on a regular basis in my entire life. The concept never appealed to me to have coffee in the morning. I never cared. But the Keurig machine with their little pods um, has definitely re-inspired something in me. And I do find myself going to Starbucks when I'm in the parks. And I think that they did a great job of blending it into each of the four parks. I think the the people who work there, you would not notice any difference between them or real cast members, if you want, you know, quote, unquote. Um, I don't know. I just, I don't have an issue with it. I, I, I was a little concerned. I was like, ah, Starbucks, you know, like when they brought the cheesy McDonald's back in the days of when Animal Kingdom first opened. Right. But, and so they started selling the French fries, you know, instead of the Disney fries. Right. But no, I've got no problem with it. What do you think? Yeah, see... This this is another one for me that that's why it was on my list was because when this was announced, Disney fans, not all, but some lost their minds. They were so upset. Oh, my God. Starbucks is invading the park. How can how dare Disney's management (laughs) bring in this huge company to take over coffee in Walt Disney World Parks? It's insane. Guess what? 1955 Disneyland opened. Guess what was yeah. on Disneyland, Disneyland's Main Street? The Maxwell a bra House place and the Maxwell House <laughs> Coffee Shop. Oh, it, okay, but there was also like a bra. In place. addition yeah. to the Wizard of Bras, yes, that was the name of the. That was the, amazingly the actual name of the store was the Wizard of Bras. I love that that name; it's fantastic. But I mean, there was it was a Maxwell House Coffee Shop on Main Street USA in Walt Disney's Disneyland in 1955. There was also a car. See, you can see I'm getting fired up about this. There was also a Carnation ice cream parlor in Disneyland. The Golden Horseshoe, okay, where, you know, Wally Bogue, I think it's Bogue, right? I, yes. I always forget how to pronounce his last name. I feel bad. Uh, where he played his show for decades. It was, a, it's, it's still a Disneyland icon. Guess what? Sponsored by Pepsi in 1955. Yes. Not only that, the curtain, the main curtain on the stage had a huge Pepsi Cola Cola Pepsi Cola logo on it. So don't yes. that's the thing. That's what drove me nuts. Don't tell me that corp- corporations aren't allowed or aren't supposed to be in the parks. They were there. They funded the park in the beginning. They funded all the attractions, the big attractions. How did Walt Disney get his attractions into the New York World's Fair in 64, 65? Every one of them had a sponsor. Actually, with the exception of Great Moments with uh, Mr. Lincoln. So I, it drives me crazy when people say that. So, And I think you're per- you were perfectly right on that they did a great job. I think the Starbucks on – and that's what people – listen, I get it. That, that Disney fans were upset about the Main Street Bakery. It's been there forever. But 
it's they did a good job. The, some of the favorites are still there, not all of them, I understand, but they've they did a good job of moving some of those snacks that were favorites that aren't sold there anymore to different locations in the Magic Kingdom and other parks. You could still get everything you wanted. So I think they did a great job and sorry to lose my mind for a minute. But <laughs> I, I I like Starbucks and I, I I didn't like the coffee that Disney had that Disney was offering in the parks before this. So I think I think it's a, a perfect fit really. I agree. And I must say as a local, what the only thing that I think is weird is that Universal also has Starbucks in their parks and in City Walk. And I, I think that's weird. I think I, I'm surprised that there wasn't like the whole Coca-Cola thing where only Disney parks had Coca-Cola. And um, I, I think that's a little weird that it that it feels and, and just the same, uh, whether you're in a Universal Park or a Disney Park when it comes to, you know, when you feel like having some coffee. Hey, good for Starbucks. They figured it out. Well, true. <laughs> that guy, that guy. That that guy, I forget his name. He went Bennett Starbucks. Man, oh, yeah, I never remember that. He's shoo, he's all right. If I could have, <laughs> a, 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 I mean, a, a millionth of what that guy's worth. Um, <laughs> so okay, uh, let's here, here's here's my next. I'm up next, right? Yeah, because yes, I went nuts on that one, but that wasn't even mine. All right, so no, no, go ahead. So I'm looking at my list, trying to figure out where I want to go. All right, so this is the one I'm going with next. In I forget what year it was announced. I think it was it was six years ago, I think, at this point, 2011. I think uh, Disney announced that Pandora, the world of Avatar, was coming to Disney Animals. Disney Animal. Why can't I say that? Disney's Animal Kingdom. And again, another thing, people were so upset by it. Disney, as we said before, fanboys, so, so, so upset. How dare they put this this property in a park? It's not what Animal Kingdom is all about. Animal Kingdom is all about the animals and protection and conservation and all of this. And it, it completely polarized, I think, Disney fans. I think people were super, super excited about it, or they just hated the idea. So the land is coming. So anybody who is still mad about it, if you want to be still go to Walt Disney World, you might want to avoid Animal Kingdom because it's, it's, all, it's there. The floating mountains are in place. The ride systems are in. They're, they're, you know, they're saying 2017 as an opening date. Who knows what that means, really? I Actually, I, I have heard from pretty good sources. It, soft openings could start as early as March. See, that's awesome. I didn't know that. So you're, yeah. So, all right. So March, when am I coming? I'm going to be there in April. Sweet. Okay. <laughs> I'll be, I'll, that is my work trip in April. So I'm excited about that. I will also be running the dark side half marathon again for that trip so that's gonna be cool anyway the i'm excited about it i i didn't love avatar i didn't think it was this masterpiece of a film i think james cameron's good i trust disney's imagineers i really want to walk on the ground that lights up when you walk on it. i'm excited <laughs> about that i think that looks really cool and for those who think that this wasn't you know because people wanted beast of the kingdom and they wanted that because the dragon was on the logo of the park. I mean, that's what's supposed to be Beastly Kingdom, and you're not getting it now. You're getting Avatar, so I think they're gonna have to change the dragon to like the blue guy from Avatar. Like, put that blue, <laughs> he'll be like the middle of the nut. But I mean, and the people that complain and they're saying, well, it doesn't fit the park, it's not about conservation, it's completely that's what the, all the movies about is about the conservation of the species. And so, I think it kind of fits the theme of the park well. I, I think. You know, it, it's going to give us a reason to go, another reason to go to the park at night, besides Rivers of Light, which just got pushed back again. <laughs> and oh, it did? Oh, yeah. Now they're saying uh, mid-2017, before we even get to see that show. So, yeah, so don't, don't, don't hold your breath for Rivers of Light. <laughs> but uh, that's a, who is that a PR disaster for Disney right there? But yeah. I just think, I, I, I get it. I get why people were negative about the whole Avatar Pandora thing. I understand it. I think it's going to be great. And as we were saying earlier, I don't consider myself a Disney King do no wrong kind of guy. I'm excited for it. So, yes, it's super controversial, but I can't wait. So my take on this is that this is exactly one of the, the best examples that tells you that the Disney fandom, and I'm sure with all other pop culture things that, you know, that there's a lot of fans uh, uh, about um 
they've got to watch what they say because they they completely contradict themselves constantly in the things over the years that they that they 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 riot over. Because if if Beastly Kingdom had been uh, opened, you know, relatively soon around 1998 when the park opened, then at this point, now that we've seen Harry Potter lands. Then the Disney fandom fanboys would have been all up in arms because, oh, Beast of Kingdom is not based on IP and it's not interactive enough and it doesn't actually recreate <laughs> right. something we love like the Harry Potter lands. Right. So either way, they – and so they, I think they forget that and they forget that, okay, Beast of Kingdom never got open. Fine. It is what it is. It was obviously a budget thing. It doesn't matter because we all went to Animal Kingdom a million times since 1998 without it. Um, and then – by the time they were ready to to finally open a land that would have been about uh, fictional animals as opposed to real, then by then we we saw what Universal could do with the Harry Potter the Har- Harry Potter Harry Potter concept, and so they decided to go another route, and it's a perfect route for it. And I I've heard from people who have already been in the construction site and stuff. It's they're not joking. I mean, it definitely will be uh, completely. Immersive. I've heard even rumors about the fact that it won't even have uh, signs for the bathrooms because it wouldn't make any sense for there a sign to be like, here's a bathroom, uh, you know, on, on another planet. It's extremely immersive. And the boat ride itself would be practically as good as like Pirates of the Caribbean would be, for example. So they, they, did, they did right. And I, and I have a feeling that once it's opened, the, 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 the Disney fanboys will shut up. I, I really do. I just have a, one question about all that. Who is Harry Potter? <laughs> uh, yes, I correct. No, I, I, Harry Potter. <laughs> <laughs> no, I listen. I think you're right. I, 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 I'm very excited about the land. I think I didn't know about the the bathroom sign thing. That intrigues me. I think that's really cool. It kind of like is a, kind of a nod to Star Wars land. They're saying like, okay, it's not just a land. It's going to be a whole like Immersive you're going to feel world. like yeah, you're going to feel like yes. you're in that world. I love that idea. And I think, you know, if, if anyone can kind of hit it out of the park, Disney can. And I'm excited Pan- about that. Pa- yes. Pandora is, is, is certainly, let's be honest about this, Pandora is the best preview we're going to get to the potential of Star Wars land. Yeah, you're because right. if they can truly create immersive environment from what I've heard, where, for example, you wouldn't have bathroom signs because why would you have a sign pointing you to a bathroom, you know, on another planet? Um, or that the merchandise, that, that in the merchandise store of Pandora, there won't be anything with Disney characters on it whatsoever. That means that, yes, they're go- they are going to do similar to what Universal did and then maybe even go up beyond it. And that Star Wars, hopefully by the time Star Wars is ready, it'll be go even beyond that. Yeah, I, you know what? I hope Disney, you know, I don't ask a cast member where the bathroom is in that land. And they just point to a row of trees. And they're just like, oh. <laughs> it's and immersive. And when you use it, it lights up. <laughs> it's, immersive. <laughs> it's immersive. There you go. You wanted immersion. <laughs> you wanted Harry Potter land. There's the bathroom. It's a fern that lights up. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, Chuck. I think it's you're up for your next one, right? Um. Yes. Okay. So I'm gonna go with a big one. This is certainly a topic that could take hours and hours by itself. Um, on a podcast, but it is what I guess people refer to as the abandoning of the original um Epcot concept. Nice. And I know we've touched upon this. Um, I feel when it comes down to it, I feel like okay, Disney at this point with Epcot, you can only go to one of two ways. You can either say okay, the theme of Epcot is literally Epcot. It literally is um, a nostalgic look at back in the day in the 80s and 70s when we used to think about the future. We used to think of it as just this, you know, this grand uh, env- environment that we're going to get to be in where everything is, is way better than it is now. And it's all it's 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 something to hope for. And it's it's certainly something to look forward to. Now, what we've learned is that the future right now is incredible. I mean, there are so many things that it never would have occurred to us that we would have on a daily basis back when we were kids. But the truth is the future is exactly what the world is always going to be, which is it's complicated. There'll be some things that people will love, some things that people won't. It'll, it'll move too fast. It'll arrive way too fast for some people, and they're going to freak out. But, but in the end, that's what the future really is. So Yes, they could go backwards. They could have uh, nostalgic attractions once again that make you think of what we used to think the future would be like. 
or they can do exactly what they're doing, which I I don't have a problem with. I don't have a problem with the attractions turning into into um, into IP uh, inspired attractions or things that have to do with what is cool right now. I really don't. Yeah, I I don't either. And I we you're right. We did touch on this a little bit before, and I. I agreed with you then. I agree with you now. I, the more, you know, the more stuff you can bring in and keep me entertained and merrier. I'm not going to be upset if, now listen, that's not, that's not exactly true. If they decide to take, and do you remember the theory or the idea of this in the nineties when the theory was, the idea was they were going to take, they were going to gut spaceship earth and put like a time racers attraction in there. Do you remember this? It was like a roller coaster. Yes. Yes. That would, that would upset me to no end, but if Why? You, just because I'm a yeah, that I'm kind of contradicting myself. You're right. I am completely contradicting myself. Actually, I love Spaceship Earth. I don't want them to touch it. That's as simple as that. But I get the other things. I get Universe of Energy is something that there's the rumored Guardians of the Galaxy attraction that may go in there that we've heard about for a while. I get that. I, I think the Ellen's Energy Adventure, or whatever it's called now, is a dated attraction it you know it's very it's way too long to hold people's attention these days i think halfway through you're looking for an exit i really do uh i like what they did with the nemo attraction with you know the living seas i i enjoyed the living seas when it was there i really did but i think the nemo thing makes it accessible for everybody i wasn't going to take a three or five year old on the living seas they just would have been bored to to death but I will take them on the seas with Nemo and friends because they know those characters and they then they get to see the fish. And then we spend the time in the aquarium afterwards with the manatees and you go upstairs and you see the dolphins. And it's, it's it, you know, again, it, it I'm kind of <laughs> taking both sides of it. I'm taking this. Well, this, I is what I, I this is what I say stance. about Disney fanboys is that you, you wind up contradicting yourself with the things that you become yes, I just did. Pa- passionate about. You do. And, and I got to say, especially specifically about Spaceship Earth, because I said this to someone not long ago, is that, okay, yes, I like the idea that Spaceship Earth is still there and that it's probably, I guess, really, it's the only, besides, li- besides uh, living with the land, the only attraction that is closest to what i remember you know in this in the 80s um and 90s um but i have to be honest when i go to epcot and i go on spaceship earth it's only because there's no line whatsoever and when i'm on the ride i know that i'm just thinking about what i'm going to do right afterwards i'm not actually watching and observing and being like "Ooh, this is great like i have since, <laughs> 19, since the summer of 1983 i'm not all i'm doing is thinking about okay when i get the, when i get off this ride then i have to meet this person over there i'm gonna get some food <laughs> i'm not actually taking it in the way that i used to right but that's your experience other people agreed yeah agreed like, it's a locals experience other people who were there every five years or once every 20 years they're gonna want spaceship earth and they're gonna hang on every word the caveman is saying so <laughs> I agree. My, my, I guess my point is that we have to be honest ourselves about our about nostalgia because n- nostalgia is not well, exactly h- how you think it is. You you will find yourself being comforted by having something that's that that's been around forever, but when you're actually experiencing it, you're not you're not um, experiencing the way that you used to. So th- that makes it hard for me to understand when people. I, I understand when people would like, oh, I wish there wasn't le- leaving. But really, once it gets replaced and it's something really cool, they'd be like, wow, this is awesome. I'm so glad they replaced this ride with this. On a very special ear to ear podcast. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's kind of what I felt like. You know what I mean? Like, like it was a good moment for that. Uh, yeah, but you're right. It's, it's funny the, the, the nostalgia, how I completely talked out of both sides of my mouth. But I. Yes. It. It's true. I, I want the new stuff, but I want my favorites to stay there. So, yeah, I'm just a complete fraud, and I shouldn't be doing this podcast. And I should- <laughs> no, but the thing is that we're all we're all like this. I don't know. I know this is a tangent, but you always go into tangents. Sure. The, when um, my family and I were talking recently about um, like watching the show The Goldbergs, I'm assuming you love that show. Ah, I watched you- the first season. And I know. And I- oh, you haven't continued? Okay. And, oh, no, and you're no, from I Philadelphia, will. too. I, know, I, I would will. think that I you would have even a more special connection to the show. I, I do. I really do. The first season, I, it, it was my childhood. It really was. It was Right, exactly. But I have, so- to, I have to go back to it. I just haven't had the time. Okay. 
So what I was saying to, you know, to my brother and my parents is that, yes, it's, you know, every episode we start texting each other, been like, oh, my God, we had that or we did that or, you know, we did really talk about that back then in the 80s when it was just the four of us in a house with with toys and a VCR. And so there's a moment where I'm like, wow, you know, life was so simple back then. You wish that you go back to it. But then if I start going through the list of all the phenomenal things that I get to do on a daily basis now as an adult in my 40s with the new technology that we have nowadays, I'd be like, no, of course I don't want to go back to the 80s and be with my parents and my brother. (laughs) (laughs) No, I remember seeing this thing once and it was a, and again, this is a tangent, so hopefully I don't have to edit this if I I don't want to go too long. But there was this uh, advertisement that I saw a couple of years ago and it was an iPhone. It was like two sides of a, of a like graph, right? And there's an iPhone on one side of it. And then the, I'm holding my iPhone up to the microphone just so you can see it. <laughs> um, so there's an iPhone on the one side and then there's a line drawn down the middle. And then the other side of the graph is everything that you used to need to do what an iPhone can do. And it yes. was a telephone, it was a fax machine, it was a VCR, a camera, you know, a computer. It was just this, this crazy thing. And I was like, that is amazing. Of course you wouldn't want to go back then. But right. you're right, it's that nostalgia. It's the, it's the uh, I, I feel it coming on the very special ear to their podcast coming on again. It's, <laughs> that's what it is. It's the nostalgia that I, I, fell, I fell right into my own trap of saying, like, yeah, I want... I want the new stuff, but yeah, man, do I yearn for the old stuff? But I really do. I like. I don't. I'm anyway. This is this is something we're gonna get to. I think in a minute. So I want to. Uh, I'll stop there because I want to keep going and going okay. and going if I don't. So, okay. all right. So that was was that you? That was you, right? Uh, that was me. Yes. Okay. So uh, my next one, uh, and it may. I guess it won't be my last, but I, I have a few more. This one <laughs> is is very very controversial. Was at the time. And it's something that I think no one looks back on. No one looks back on favorably. And it's in 1996 for <laughs> Walt Disney World's 20th, 25th anniversary. Yeah, Cinderella Castle was turned into an enormous pink birthday cake. Yes. I, I don't – I've run some – I've actually – this is – to say that no one was – or no one remembers it fondly is a bit of a lie. Because I've run some polls on my Facebook page or put the picture up. And people say, like, uh, that was my first trip to Walt Disney World, and I love it. I don't. <laughs> I, I thought it was hideous. I thought it was silly. I thought it would be, the Disney completely struck out by, by covering up their icon and putting, you know, fiberglass, Pepto-Bismol colored stuff on it. I, I, I think, you know, I went, I was there that, that summer, the summer of 97, actually, to visit some friends who were on the college program, and I, I couldn't stand it. I, I forget that, that feeling of walking into the Magic Kingdom under the train tracks, going into Town Square, and looking down Main Street to see the castle. That was gone. Because when you made that turn onto Main Street and you saw that, you were like, what the? the that, <laughs> that's the reaction you had. It wasn't good. Controversial, I think, may not be, the, this might not even fit, because I think, Probably ninety percent of the people you would ask would say that that look of that castle was horrible. But I, I had to, I couldn't not mention it on this episode because it kind of fits. Uh, agreed, and that was that was potentially on my list as well. And the way that I look at it is, yeah, I don't necessarily actually I don't really give it a moment of thought to be honest of whether I truly at the time hated it or not. I, I I do think it's interesting that you know at the time we we still didn't really have the internet and stuff, so. So, yes, it's still like you hear or you see a picture in a magazine of the fact that it's switched to a birthday cake, but then you see it on your own. Now, of course, anything that happens, we'll know about it the second that it happens. It doesn't matter if we don't actually get to go to Walt Disney World until years later. Right. Um, but um, I don't really remember what I thought about it. But I do remember that that uh, that was the year of my college program and the year that I was going to school in Miami and going up going up to Walt Disney World very often and I had suddenly I had a new group of friends living in Orlando so I don't so so I it's a symbol of a time when I actually loved Walt Disney World it doesn't matter what my feelings were specifically about the birthday cake does that make sense it does again it's, we're very deep today <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> not a, this isn't a superficial podcast people <laughs> no not at all <laughs> this is very very deep yeah no of course and, and that 
That's why there's things in the parks or in the, you know, resorts that remind me, you know, my first trip was, uh, I think 91, 92. I, I always forget what year it was. I think it was 92. Uh, and, you know, there were certain things about it, Spectre Magic, especially that stood out to me that that got people ripped that constantly for, you know, not being as good as the mainstream electrical parade. And I liked it more. I loved it. So I think you're right. I think it's not so much as what it, what it was, or what it was more like what it represented to you. But that, that castle cake was horrible. <laughs> yes. <laughs> the agreed. color of it, the, the gumdrops and the, the cake candles and the, eesh. it wasn't, like I said, forget about the fairy tale. The fairy tale feeling was gone. It was more like a, you make that turn on the main street and you see, I don't know, you feel like queasy and you need Pepto Bismol. That's kind of what it felt like to me. <laughs> um, so, all right, Chuck, you're up for your next one. Okay, um, just a quick one. For me, it's quick because I'm not, I don't really have a very passionate feeling about this either way, but it does come up, especially with my brother and sister in law who, who they, they, they do like to definitely uh, have some alcoholic beverages while they're at Walt Disney World. And, um, and especially if they were at the Magic Kingdom, they would, if they could, but of course, you can't unless you go to the Be Our Guest restaurant. So I guess that's the controversy, right? Is that they finally did allow alcohol. Um, in the Magic Kingdom by having those, I guess, I think it was only like two items, wasn't it, that's on the menu at the Be Our Guest restaurant? Uh, originally, it was just a few. Now, it's just several. Oh, okay. I mean, okay. it's. I mean, when you say items, you mean just two different types Drink. of alcohol? Yeah, like, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, no, I guess I really thought it was just one beer and one wine, but I guess no, it's now there's, I, there's like 10 beers and a whole different okay. bunch of wine. Yeah, there's, it started out, the list was very small, but now, like, like we said, I think we talked about this before, like, you can't go in and get a Miller Lite, but you can get, you know. Thank several, God. <laughs> you can go in and get several different kinds of, not only French beers now, but European beers. Correct. And so my, my take on the whole alcohol in Disney Parks thing is that, okay, so obviously it's a big part of Epcot. I mean, especially now during the Food and Wine Festival, and I was there last night, there are there are increasingly a number of groups of people who even get T-shirts made to brag about the fact that they're going to drink until they fall down on the floor yeah. while they're at Epcot. Yep. Um, and I certainly have almost – whenever I'm at um, Food and Wine Festival on a weekend night, like on a Saturday night, I do always see at least one person that Disney security has to start to have a chat with. I always. Never fails. Every year I've ever gone. Now, we've gotten used to that. It's kind of – it's been a thing you know, since the 80s. At the Magic Kingdom, obviously, we would never see that, and we probably wouldn't want to see it. But then I look at, you know, I went to Disneyland Paris, and yes, I saw people ordering beers and, and wine, you know, and walking around the park or at lunch, and you didn't see crazy drunk people. So I, I, don't, I don't assume that if you could buy uh, a beer and wine um, in the Magic Kingdom that people would start acting like idiots like they would at Epcot, maybe just because it's, such a, uh, it's just a different type of of day that you're going to have um, at the Magic Kingdom as opposed to leisurely around Epcot and just kind of focusing on the food more than the rides? I don't know. I mean, if I had to choose, I would say don't do it um, and leave it the way that it is where you can only purchase it at an extremely expensive restaurant. Right. Uh, but, but yeah, that's kind of my take on it. I don't think I really fall really, you know, really, um, uh, really solidly on either one, uh, either side of the controversy. Yeah, I, I I don't either. Uh, I do drink alcohol. I don't. I, I obviously have had shows dedicated to what the best drinks are. <laughs> yes, and the best beers. I've mentioned that I drink alcohol on the show. I don't ever in a million years. I would never get blitzed at Walt Disney World. It's just not. Uh, you know, I listen. Not to say I didn't. I did drink around the world when I was a kid. I, well, maybe not a kid. I was twenty one. I was legal. It was you know, the year I turned twenty one, we did that. Uh, my friends and I. Like old college program roommates and I actually, and uh, it's it's not something I would do now with a family and as a well I was going to say as an adult but who are we kidding right <laughs> <laughs> as some semblance of the older person I would say, uh, but yeah it, I'm fine with not having it anywhere else in Magic Kingdom that's completely fine with me would I I don't think it would change the dynamic of the park much if it was available only right. because I think. Like that, the the Food and Wine Festival and now the Flower and Garden Festival at Epcot lends itself to that. It 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 promotes the alcohol, it promotes it, and I think that's what leads the people having the shirts made up and doing it 
and it becoming a, a bachelor party or a bachelorette party event. I mean, it, I've seen those there as well. Oh, uh, that's increasingly very popular. Yes. Yeah. So I think that's, you know, with those, with those special events, which are awesome, by the way, I love food and wine, but you're going to get those types of, those types of parties, those types of groups that are going to come through. And as long as they're respectful, I don't have any problem with it at all, but I do get it that you're right. They, there's little kids there and a lot of them can be unruly and not, you know, I, I don't, as a parent, I wouldn't want that around my kids at all. No, of uh, course not. I wouldn't either. And so, even with the way I talk about kids, no, I would not. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, but, like, here's my question to you. When the Disneyland Star Wars, Star, you know, land opens out there, there's, there's bound to be a cantina. And Disneyland is a dry park, except for Club 33. Do they open, do they serve alcohol in the cantina? Kind of like they do... At be our guest in Magic Kingdom. I mean, I think they're going to have to, right? You know, it's I haven't thought about this, but suddenly a certain a certain comparison comes to mind, which is um, the Harry Potter lands at Universal with their butter beer. So I guess my thinking is you can create very unique non alcoholic drinks that you would expect to have if you were truly in a in the cantina in a galaxy far, far away. It doesn't have to have alcohol in it to still be authentic to the movie. You're right. But then again they do serve Bud and Bud Light in in the Harry Potter areas in, in Universal. Well yeah, but that's because we you know the Universal Parks have always um served alcohol right. no matter what. So we just take that part for granted. But, but I mean but when they finally get made a, a drink but don't try to get a soft drink. Don't try to get a, a Coke in those lands because they'll tell you, well, th- this is authentic, so we don't sell Coke products in, ha- in the Harry Potter land. This has actually happened to me. You have to go next door to the neighboring land to buy a Coke. I was like, really? But you have Budweiser here. <laughs> like, I don't yeah, understand. Well, that but, that so. just goes with the whole, with our, our cynical case for, you know, how corporations work and always have and always will. Yeah, I guess. But <laughs> that yeah. money is more important than anything else in the world and it always has been, always will be. I, you're right. But uh, I'm just saying, if you're going to go with authenticity, go with true immersion and authenticity. Agreed. Don't, you know, go halfway. But you're right. I think Disneyland could create something like a, like a blue milk kind of drink in the Star Wars land that only is available in the cantina and yes, it would work. But I do think there is going to be a, a big, yeah, it's going to, it's going to be a fight either way with, with Disney, with Disneyland people, because there's going to be the purists always who are going to say, you know, Walt didn't want alcohol in his park and absolutely not. But we have those in magic kingdom. I mean, in, in Walt Disney world now who hate the serve this, you know, the selling of the alcohol at all and anywhere in the parks. So those people are going to have a good fight on their hands with the people who were like, hey, listen, it's a Star Wars watering hole. Where's my alcoholic, you know, I don't know, Blendini. You know what I mean? So I don't know what a Blendini is. I, it's, <laughs> but I've, I've heard that somewhere. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So, all right. So I have... Um, that was, that was you now. It's not, I'm, up no, I'm, I'm done. So I'd be happy to just now just talk about your remaining one. See, I'm, I'm really surprised that you're done. Right. Because I have right. This is my last one. This is the last, the one I'm going to close on because okay. I, I thought for sure. This is why I said this for last, that you were going to have, well, I have like four ride, you know, attraction removals. You that, mean spe- oh, specific? I see. I just decided not to go through the, the specific attraction. Because I just, I guess I just bolt them into my general thought about these controversies. Okay, you know what I mean? Because, yeah, because there's, there's a list of them. I mean, there's a list oh, of, of the ones, especially in the last 20, 25 years, that, you know, that D- Disney has to keep moving forward. For, sorry for the cheesy, you know, phrasing, but it's true. They can't remain, it can't remain the same or people aren't going to keep coming back. They need to put new things in. They need to, like you were saying, have, they have all this IP that they need to use. They want to yeah. put into the parks. So they have to evolve. And attractions that aren't getting the attendance they used to have are going to be replaced. And the controversy is when you get rid of things like 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, when you get rid of Mr. Toad's Wild Ride, when you get rid of Horizons, people are going to really be upset. And there's but not- it's always going to be, like, you, like, like Lee Cockrell said, it's always going to be a small percentage of people. Even if they're the noisiest, it's still a small percentage of people. You just sound like my, <laughs> my father, while <laughs> the squeaky wheel gets the grease. That, that's, that's it. You're right. It's the, it's the small percentage of people that are going to be heard. 
And I didn't shed a tear when 20,000 Leagues was removed, even though I only got to ride that attraction once in my life. I can still ride Mr. Toad's while riding at Disneyland if I want to, even though, uh, as Lauren Gaggioli said in last week's episode, that it's only one, it's one track out in Disneyland, not two. And well, there's the world version. There was the two different tracks, which is cool. And I can ride Horizons whenever I want by going on YouTube. There's some really good YouTube clips from Horizons. Of course. You can do it. And again, no one, no one, and I said this on the show before, and people got upset with me, but I want to say it again. No one ran straight to Maelstrom when World Showcase opened. And if you say you did, you're crazy. You did. <laughs> so I, I get why they're, they're a big, it's a big controversy. I get why people want these, and we were just touched on it earlier, why people want these attractions to stay. But you can't tell me that and with any of these that, you know, that what Disney has in place of them now aren't better than what were there before. And I get, I get Maelstrom, people, because it's the most recent, people get the most upset about it. And I haven't even had the chance to ride Frozen every after yet. I'm not going to get to do it for 80 days, I, I think it is. But I'm excited. I've seen the videos. I'm not one of those people that's like, I'm not going to watch the video. I want to see it in person. Listen. I couldn't wait to see the video as soon as it. Uh, oh yeah, I was waiting on YouTube that day that the ride opened, and I was sitting waiting for the clips to start coming in. So I, it looks fantastic to me. I, I don't have firsthand. I know you've written it. Yes, uh, and I, listen, I get it. I get people are upset that these interactions have to go, but to me, you know, I'm excited about the new stuff. I, I love New Fantasyland. I love, and I even like Princess Fairytale Hall. Like I think that's for for me for a dad with little girls. We'll we'll be at Princess Fairy Town Hall every single trip, and we probably will be until they're you know teenagers. And I don't care. I'll wait in line to meet a princess. I think it's great. Yes. Um, <laughs> I love it. I yes. will never do that. Okay. <laughs> no, you might because Elena. No, I have Ava- actually. Elena yes. of Avalor is coming to Princess Fairy Town Hall. How about that? Did you see yes, that? and I I'm sure that actually next Saturday I will probably be waiting in line for that for yeah Elena, because your niece the show. Your niece yes, she loves him. Oh, of course. Loves him. Yes. My kids love Elena that floor. So, yes. And yeah. my niece looks like Elena, so she's really upset. She kind of does. That's funny. <laughs> she kind of does. And it's cool to have – you have a, a princess that looks like you. That's cool, man. Of course. Like that, you know, that's – for a lot of little girls who hadn't had that before, now they have it. It's That's awesome. Exactly. So, yeah, I'm excited about that stuff. I'm excited about Elena Bavalour. I like Princess Veritas Hall. I'm a dad. There's nothing I can do about it. <laughs> and yeah, so this is cool, man. This is a good list. I, I think. Well, actually, can I say one thing then? No, because... I, I'm. Well, I'm right. No, yes, of course you can say one thing. Okay, because because <laughs> talking about that, then there was one one controversy that I was going to put in the list, but now what we just talked about kind of it correlates really perfectly with it, which is the controversy of the closed attractions that just sit there. So I do feel like it's that then, then it kind of annoys me because I'm, I do have faith that, you know, an old ride that I, that I love like horizons, for example. Okay. Yes. I I love horizons. I wish that right now I could jump in my car and 40 minutes later, I'm at Epcot and I could ride horizons again, but we are living in a different time. There are plenty of YouTube videos, and it's almost the same by just watching, you know, the <laughs> point of view video of of all from the queue all the way to exiting the attraction building. And you know, people who grew up, especially people who grew up in Disneyland, where you know the the attractions from the fifties, sixties, and seventies who are gone now, there barely are any you know video of that, so they can't really relive it. And I know some people try to recreate it digitally and and whatnot, but anyway. So it does bother me when the attraction sit, just sits there, like the Wonders of Life bu- building, which I go into during the Food and Wise Festival right. just to get my little uh, cup of my four dollar cup of uh, melted uh, chocolate in a in a cup. And I see that Body Wars is right there, and I'm like, oh man, remember when we used to ride Body Wars like all the time? Um, and it's just sitting there, right there, ten feet away. It's still there. Um, or the River Country thing, you know, when you go to Fort Wilderness, you can see River Country is, is still there, for example. So what do you think about that? Because that does bother me when it just sits there and they and, and it's like a tease and they don't replace it with something cool. Yeah, yeah I agree. I Discovery Island is the same thing. It's just sitting in the yes. middle of the, of the lake there and begging to be used. I mean, we had the, the one episode where we talked about the imaginary imagineering. What would we do if we had – Yes. We could put it in a, and, and you're right. I agree. That bo- That really does bother me. And you know – for years, you would walk past the uh, Adventureland Veranda, which was the old restaurant there, 
And it was not, and now it's Skipper Canteen. But for decades, there was nothing there. It was just an empty Correct. building. I mean, they used it for what? Princess meet and greets once in a while, or Cinder, or and there were some corporate Bell. events sure, inside. Sure, but there was nothing that you could do on a daily the basis public. there. Yeah, no. And I, I, I agree. I, I don't know why. I guess because it's expensive to demolish something like River Country. That's why it's still there. Sure. Uh, that when they can just close, you know, put a chain link fence around it and lock it up, uh, which. You know, that hasn't kept everyone out, believe it or not. There's yes, there's yes. the quote-unquote urban explorers who have been through there. I, p- please don't ever do that. That, that place is falling <laughs> apart. It is, from the pictures that I've seen that were taken a couple of years ago, it looks dangerous. Super well, not dangerous. not for nothing, but I think apparently they finally do have to demolish it because uh, the water just sits there and it attracts the mosquitoes. It's something, oh, that makes sense, yeah. Something like that, yeah. Yeah, so, but yeah, you're... You're right. It's it's it is kind of upsetting to see something that's just going to sit there and and go to waste, like the the wonders of life pavilion. It that's really sad. It's a huge pavilion. It's a huge building. And yeah, it is. Yeah, that there's definitely something something has to go in there, right? I mean, Epcot. I I would think after Star Wars Land and is and Toy Story Land and the World of Pandora and with New Fantasyland and Magic Kingdom, Epcot's got to be getting some some rehab yeah. money thrown its way soon. I think. There's just too many. Th- there are too many things that are kind of not being used now. Interventions, they're just not being used in Epcot. So you're going to have to. It's going to need. And and let's be for real. Like some of the some of the attractions there, and you know the the Pixar short film. That's not an attraction. That's not. A, that's not even a. That's a bad use of that theater. Uh, Correct. Not that Captain EO was a whole lot better, but <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> I, I don't get the Captain EO people either. Sorry, Captain EO fans. I, don't, <laughs> I, I watched it for nostalgia purposes a few trips ago, and I was like, man, that is a trippy, trippy show. So um, you don't, you don't, you don't miss going. It's just another part of me. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> and with that, I think it's been a long time since I've sang on one of your podcasts. That's so. true. That. that <laughs> Definitely will stay in and will not be edited out of the podcast. Perfect. All right, Chuck. Well, that was fun, and I think yes, it was. Thank you. But thanks for thanks for uh, for coming on again. It was a lot of fun, and uh, yeah, we're, I'm looking forward to the next one of these we do. Thank you. Me as well. And that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Ear to Their podcast. Thank you again to my guest, Chuck Rodriguez, the one and only Chuck Rodriguez, for stopping by once again. It is always a blast to record an episode with Chuck. And thank you for listening. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I really sincerely, sincerely hope you're enjoying these episodes. Like I always say, they're a lot of fun to do. And as long as people keep downloading them, as long as people keep listening, I'm going to keep making them. It's a lot of fun, and I really enjoy it. So thank you so much once again uh, for listening and for telling people about the show. It's greatly appreciated. So at the end of every show, I usually ask you a favor. And this week, this favor is going to be a little bit different. So this week, I want to know from you, what do you like about the show? Do you like the regular Ear to Their podcast episodes? Do you like the Word of the Week episodes? What would you like to hear more of? Or what would you like to hear a little less of? And I'd always love to hear what your favorite episode so far of the podcast has been. So please feel free to let me know that as well. So please either comment on the Facebook page, send me an email with your thoughts to phil at ear to their travel.com, or you can always call the voice line at 267 551 1971 and let me know what you like about the show, what you don't like. And even if you have an idea for a future upcoming episode, I'd love to hear it. And just remember, there will be a new episode of the Ear to Their podcast each and every Monday morning, as well as a new episode of the Word of the Week podcast each and every Wednesday morning. So until next time, thank you so much again for listening. Have a great week. Bye-bye. Ear to Their